Thank you. We are really excited to be here. Um, basically, today we're talking about how it can be really easy in open source projects to see things with rose-colored glasses. I mean, open source ideals are very, um, they're really nice to think about. It's all about inclusion and collaboration and openness and everything. But sometimes, when it comes down to it in reality, things become a little less uh, uh, ideal. So, is this actually working? Yes, okay. So, I, we're coming at this with a perspective of a utopia versus a dystopia, because even a dystopia from a distance can seem very shiny, very clean, very idealistic, but once you get um, into the details of the day-to-day, -day, things might come into focus and you might face problems that you weren't expecting. So, before we get into that, um, we're gonna introduce ourselves. My name is Crystal. I am a web designer and developer. I have my own web studio building websites, of course, uh, for nonprofits. Um, I'm the current Joomla Experience team lead and also the incoming president of Open Source Matters, which is the organization behind the Joomla project. Um, and I live in Athens, Greece. And that's me, hi. My name is Sigrid. Um, I own a web agency close to Vienna in Austria. Um, we are a team of four and we're focusing on ch websites built with Joomla. Um, I'm an active member also in the community. Uh, currently I'm CMS release team lead. So there's all the release managers and it's like internationally organized of course. And um, I'm also co-organizer of the Joomla user group in Vienna and the Joomla Day DACH, so which is the, we're doing it together for a couple of years now, Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. Yeah, so um, th the context of Joomla. Um, who of you knows Joomla from like 10 years ago? <laughs> okay, there's a couple. Who knows Joomla now, like Joomla 4? Okay, so that's less. That's what I kind of um, thought so, because um, Joomla is still the second largest open source CMS, far behind WordPress, but still, it's still the second largest. And um, it was forked from Mambo in 2005, and um, yeah, it's a completely community-driven um, um, uh, CMS. Uh, there's the, as Crystal said, the um, Open Source Matters is the nonprofit organization behind it. And um, yeah, Joomla 3 um, start, was released in 2012, and then a long time, nothing, I mean, there were releases, of course, and new functions, but the next major release was um, Joomla 4 in 2021, so after nine years. And um, it, it was a focus on uh, accessibility, for example, also on the back end, so for users in the back end. Um, a focus was also on a clean code base and security and API, web services, and also like a task scheduler and workflow. So there's a lot of um, new features and a lot of um, modern code. So, um, but it, it was a long gap in between. And I think that's also why we lost some of community and also um, because of Corona, like many projects, I think. So at the beginning we had communities all over the world. And right now the, the active contributors, most of them are in Central Europe. And um, even though users are still over, all over the world, and we want to kind of look how did this happen. So when we were putting the slides together, Sigrid at some point shared this quote with me about the first step toward change is awareness. Because even though we're, we know kind of that there are some problems, um, since we can see it with the number of contributions going down, that we, we have fewer people directly involved with the project, um, but we don't necessarily know exactly why. So we decided, uh, as we were going through this talk, to kind of look at um, maybe some of the different ways that people are facing challenges and what kind of problems we are having in the project. And a lot of what it comes down to in the Joomla project and in other open source projects is that it, there's a dependency on passive inclusion. Um, which is basically this concept that if you want it, you need to do it. People are going to come to you. If you have a popular project, um, then it's not really a visible problem. Because you have enough people um, coming to the project and contributing um, and 
doing things organically because they have that internal motivation to do so, to be a part of, of an active popular project. But if a project becomes less popular or less active, um, then some of these contributions start to fall off and um, there is fewer incentive to push past whatever barriers you might be facing for a contribution uh, and it becomes more obvious what kind of issues people might be facing. And it becomes a cycle of doom because then you lose contributions and then um, fewer people are, are, are incentivized to, to participate and then you lose more contributions and so on and so forth. So unless we address the barriers, it's going to continue forever. So, yeah, and that's why we try to figure out what, what's the what's kind of a, a logic or what's the kind of the, the, the topics. And uh, contributors, um, they face different kind of barriers and challenges. And uh, we think generally they fall into these categories. Uh, one is accessibility. Um, Joomla has a strong focus on accessibility for users and for red, um, people building websites and writing text. Uh, then uh, language in the international community, like technical barriers and also um, uh, cultural barriers. And um, we're trying not to be comprehensive, but we just want to share some examples in these fields um, to, yeah, what we learned. So the first kind of barriers that I'd like to um, address or give examples for are accessibility barriers. And there's often an impression in tech that accessibility is about um, people who are physically disabled in some way, often visibly, uh, like uh, for blind individuals or deaf individuals and that sort of thing. Um, but accessibility, when, when something is accessible, whether it's a community or a product, it benefits everyone. Um, because you might have people with permanent disabilities, like the, the ones I just mentioned, or you could have someone who has a temporary disability, like um, a mother with a newborn in her arm, uh, and she can only use one hand to do things, or uh, someone who had LASIK surgery and can't see for the next 24 hours. Uh, uh, and there's also cognitive accessibility for people who are neurodiverse. Um, so there are some examples here of, of some of the places where these barriers could present themselves like the tools used to contribute. There's the obvious, if the tool is not accessible for screen readers, then people who are, uh, rely on assistive technology uh, might not be able to contribute at all. They'll be completely blocked. There's in-person events. Sometimes if uh, an event is at a location that um, uh, has no accessible access or is a, a long distance away from any everything, it could be challenging for people who uh, are uh, in a wheelchair or have um, uh, fatigue, chronic fatigue, and that sort of thing to, to attend physical events. Um, there's team organization and structure. Um, a lot of this could come in between uh, uh, with cognitive accessibility. For example, um, autistic individuals thrive on structure and very defined expectations. And people who have ADHD uh, are more likely to want more freedom, don't like uh, being told what to do. I have both, which makes it really, really fun. Um, because I, 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 I need structure, but I don't want it. Um, so there are some things that we've tried to address, some of these barriers, um, like having written meetings instead of video or voice calls in some teams. So we'll say a time that everyone will be online and we'll write things out. This sometimes helps, but it can present other challenges, which we'll, uh, I uh, talk about in a second. There's also times when we would share leadership positions, like a team lead between two people, so that the um, the burden of being a team lead is is halved. Um, there is hybrid events, of course, um, like this one. Uh, this is something we actually did before COVID with with a lot of our events, um, and it helped a lot. People who were uh, unable to come either because they had a young child at home or weren't comfortable traveling. Um, and I'd say even more so now, it's, it's really helpful. And then defining like, for example, a, a RFC process, a, a way for people to get involved and request specific features in the product. But there are also some things where we could do better to be completely transparent, like evaluating tools for accessibility before going all in on them as a project, because sometimes we will make a decision um, in a team and, and it, it turns out that perhaps
Um, and so encouraging a culture of accessibility is not just for the product, but it's also for contributors. It's also to make sure that people can access the, the community and participate fully, not just at the fringes. There's things about making meetings more accessible, like we use Google Meet, which does auto-generated captions, which is great for deaf contributors or neurodivergent contributors who like to read along with the captions, but it can sometimes have um, drawbacks. Which brings us to the language barriers. Um, I have a quote there on the side. Um, when we were preparing the, um, uh, maybe it's from last year, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. When we were preparing the meeting, you said, okay, uh, if I turn on in Google Meets the captions, um, Google is uh, trying, trying to translate. Uh, most of the times it works quite well, but it never under understands Joomla. So our main product <laughs> is, uh, it's in this time it was, yeah, Tumlet even did get the T-shirt this year. So uh, GSOC, it's, it's underneath written Joomla, even didn't get GSOC this year. So GSOC is Google Sum of Code, and uh, Joomla is um, uh, Tumlet. So um, if you ha kind of have to know the vocabulary <laughs> for uh, Google captions, and sometimes it gets really funny. But um, as Crystal said, we've... Um, we have a, a deaf contributor, and, and she's reading all the time. And some, when I know she's in the meetings, I usually turn on captions too to see what comes out, so what she would get. And maybe try to have some people, uh, other people know, of course, so we try to help with uh, writing or, or explaining. And sometimes it's just too much, then, um, yeah, so that's the, the drawback. Or the other thing is, like, we also have people from India. And uh, the funny thing is that Google captions are very accurate for Indian English accents. So I sometimes have problems understanding the, the, the spoken Indian English, but Google captions is always perfect to read. So you kind of have to find a way around. And um, so the automatic translation is nice to know, but it's good to have like a vocab common vocabulary. And one time we really tried, we were sitting in the meeting, and we were really trying to pronounce the, the Joomla default template is called Cassiopeia, uh, and it's also almost impossible to get that uh, translated right. Um, so uh, there also needs to be awareness for um, acronyms and, and idioms and stuff like this, or saying sometimes. There's, there's a lot um, uh, German speaking um, people in the English, in the community, and then sometimes we try to translate our sayings word for word, but you don't get the, the real meaning there. So we have to be aware of that, that for us it seems like funny or explain, explanatory, but for others it's not. So, um, and also like automatic translation tools, they often bring also misunderstandings. Um, because if you don't know that somebody else used uh, like DeepL or Google Translate or whatever, so you, you, you throw in your own language <laughs> and something else comes out and you just post it into a channel, you're not sure if it's the right intention still. So, um, and um, there was also the idea to um, make it visible that it's automatically, or that, that it was a translation tool that used this part. So we are currently we are discussing if we'll use um, our own communities on MetaMost. So we were um, discussing if we would make that visible there, that this, this part was translated automatically to create awareness again and to, to help um, uh, prevent misunderstandings. Yes, so that brings us to the next part. <laughs> Cultural. So um, yesterday Ahmed did a wonderful job about presenting uh, uh, challenges of contributing to open source in um, developing countries. And so it's important to keep in mind also when you have an international open source organization that people are contributing from all over the world, from all kinds of different cultural contexts. Um, intercultural communication, it goes beyond just translation because your cultural background affects how you speak and how you communicate with people. So there's, there's places where, where there could be misunderstandings just because of communication styles. Some, some cultures communicate very directly, very blunt and straightforward, and that's, that's the most um, effective way to communicate, and it's, it's not rude, but it's, it's normal. Um, other cultures find that extremely offensive uh, and, and tell me, well, you think I'm stupid. Um, so it's, there's, there's a certain amount of awareness that you need to encourage in your community that when people are contributing from all over the world, that the communication styles, depending on the culture, could be different. 
Um, there's also the um, uh, religious or cultural calendars when you have release schedules or events um, because with events, it's a little bit more obvious. You know, you don't want to schedule an event on a major holiday for any kind of religion. Um, but uh, something that's a little less obvious is when you're making your releases, because your contributors um, have to spend the time during that uh, period leading up to the release to make sure that everything is working, to do any last final testing or pull requests and everything. And so um, in the past, we had our uh, release schedule um, falling in uh, February and August, yeah. right? Which uh, fell in the middle of major holidays for some people, or, or in August, like everyone is trying to have vacation with their families. And uh, you don't really want to intrude on that because work-life balance is important. And even if we're all volunteering our time, it's still work. It's not like I'm spending time with my family while, while I'm contributing to Joomla. So um, one of the things that we did to remove that barrier is shifting our whole release schedule to April and October, which we don't think from the, what we have seen has any conflicts, but... Um, uh, of course, if someone tells us, then we'll have to see. But, but so far, so far, so good. Um, but there are things also where we could do better. Like with conflict resolution, um, it can be challenging sometimes. Uh, we could also do better including communities outside of Central Europe because everyone... Uh, we used to have communities, very vibrant participation from um, different African countries, from South America and... Um, a, a huge uh, community in Australia, but because of COVID and because of um, this passive inclusion kind of mindset that we had up until now, uh, these communities kind of splintered off and they're not really, they're, they're, they're still possibly active um, in their local regions, but aren't necessarily contributing as much or as actively to the main project. And, um, so we're hoping to, to improve that and to improve our conflict resolution practices to make things more clear and help our uh, contributors uh, get along better even when everyone's coming from different cultural perspectives and just have an assumption of good faith and also accept the impact of what you're saying for people. Yeah, which brings us to the technical barriers. And I have another quote there um, that uh, quite, f I mean, uh, developers will understand. It's git commit um, dash m removed echo and die statements, lolled. <laughs> so that kind of, if you don't understand that, that's fine. Uh, it's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, uh, I'm not a git commit. That's if you, if you push code to, um, for example, GitHub, like to versioning, you would send it with commit. And the dash M means with a message. And then you have the message. And at the end, the dash 42, it's just because it's 42. But it's usually the, the issue number. Um, and um, in between, that's the, uh, it's just a joke, just to show. So, um, um, I mean, for PHP code, like echo and die, for example, for debugging, you use that a lot, or um, if you want to print some text, for example. So developers would find that funny, but other people would just have question marks. So. Um, uh, that's one part of the technical barriers. Um, uh, I'm starting with the, yeah, with the level of tech skills here. <laughs> but also another um, part of the um, technical bar barriers is, is bandwidth still. So if people in some countries stay um, um, in meetings, we, uh, then we, uh, sometimes we try to have at least the videos at the beginning and then we turn on the, the cameras to save bandwidth, even if you think in some, like, countries where you have good internet connection usually, but for other countries it might still be a problem. So, but we try to have, at least at the end or at the beginning, to have the videos on and in meetings, smaller meetings, we, um, like my team, we try um, to have the, the videos so we can see each other. Otherwise you're just talking to walls, but it's, it helps still if you turn off videos to have, um, to have more people contribute and get the real time thing. Yeah, the, the, another thing is that the, um, the wide variety of, of tools used, uh, I mean, like GitHub is one, or, or um, 
also for developing that there's all these different kind of tools with the automation, like to, to create the release packages or to create nightly builds, to have yeah, automated tests, whatever. So that's, that's a wide variety. And if people come in, they don't know all the details. So um, we are currently we're focusing on, on more documentation, on, um, on kind of onboarding new people to the community to figure out, okay, which party could better contribute? Is it more in documentation? It's in development? Or is it just in community stuff? It's in marketing? Whatever. So we're trying to, to keep the people motivated to, to send them to the right thing. We had a discussion about some kind of buddy system. We don't know yet if we, or how we could um, do that. Yeah, but there's, uh, we are aware of technical barriers. And um, also, like the documentation, um, we, this year we are actually not in, in Google Sum of Code, but we try to get some other, like uh, there's Google Sum of Documentation, for example, or to get, try to get into different projects. Um, and to also to, to have contributors on different uh, levels, uh, skill levels. So not just coders, but to get other contributions. Yeah, and uh, sometimes we think all the people have the, the modern devices, but they don't. <laughs> or different screen sizes. Um, uh, the, uh, not everybody has a huge or two screens or don't want one or two, sc uh, two screens, for example. So there's uh, things we could do better, and like the onboarding still. And, um, um, but I think the main focus is to be aware still, to if people forget about it, to make them aware again that it's not, uh, the technical barriers are still there, um, but maybe not for uh, people in the Central European area. So you may have noticed that when we're going through these different, um, these four different barriers, that uh, there's some overlap. There, there's overlap here, but things that could um, affect accessibility, like plain language, also help with uh, multilingual contributors. Uh, things that are technical barriers, like uh, uh, the different screen sizes and stuff, uh, could affect people who have uh, increased the font size on their devices or something. So there's a lot of overlap, but a lot of them are also caused by systemic barriers. And these are the hardest ones to find because they're so deeply embedded in, in your, uh, either your community or in the culture where you're from or in the, uh, the, the, the country, the government. Um, so these are the hardest to identify and also the hardest to mitigate. So a systematic barrier is a barrier embedded in the uh, social or administrative structures of an organization, which could include the physical accessibility, the organizational policies, the practices and decision-making processes, or even the culture. So it, it goes deep. And this is where the dystopian part comes in because you don't necessarily see it until you've seen it from the outside, what kind of challenges people might be facing. So there are things like really uh, uh, more obvious barriers like time zone differences. It's really hard to arrange a meeting between like someone in the UK and someone in Australia because there's almost no overlap of working hours. Someone has to give up some time in the middle of the night in order to actually meet um, live, even if you don't have a, a video call or something. There are things like um, understanding your own privilege in order to even contribute because you, especially for, for open source communities that are um, uh, maintained by volunteers, uh, not everyone has the time or the income to have just free time um, to spend on volunteering. Or visa access to, to, uh, to attend in-person events like this one. Um, some, some places have really, really hard procedures that they have to go through and also spend that time outside of work in order to even get the visa and sponsorships and everything. So it's, it's a lot easier to do that when you are local to most contributors. Uh, the further you get away from that, whether it's from a privilege or income perspective or from a physical distance perspective, the harder it is to actively contribute. Um, there's also the contributor bubble when you're trying to decide on new features or user research and stuff because there, it's really hard to sometimes reach your 
full user base. I mean, when you are trying to find something out, the people are, who are going to respond are the ones who are active in the community, which means people who are at a certain level of privilege. But the people who are using it just to get their job done um, might not have the time or interest to participate in user research, might not even know that any kind of research is happening. So it's, it's really hard to reach beyond that bubble in order to get the full perspective of your user base. So there are some things that we've tried in the past and are trying now in order to overcome some of these barriers. Um, in the past, we had something called the Joomla Event Traveler Program, which is where uh, people could apply for scholarships in order to travel to events, and airfare and flights and things would be paid for. Um, that's actually how I got involved in the Joomla community, because at the time, I, I did not have a job that paid very well. And um, I was very new to the community, and I applied for the Joomla Event Traveler Program in order to attend an event in Prague, uh, which I absolutely could not have gotten the Air Force for at the time. And, I, and from that, I, I was able to get really involved as a volunteer and um, participate in everything. And there are also other people um, from around the world who have been able to do that. Unfortunately, that program is not, um, uh, it's not active anymore, but hopefully in the future we will be able to bring it back again. There's also, um, Joomla days that communities arrange around the world, which are uh, uh, community-led events, but it's hard to host an in-person event because it takes money. It takes money and it takes a space and it takes time to put it together. So uh, one thing that we do is have a, a, a small sponsorship that we do for communities for just a, a small contribution. If you're hosting a Joomla day anywhere in the world that you can apply and uh, get a little bit of funds to help put that event on. There's also the Joomla World Conference, which was our official main event every year, which hasn't been happening after COVID, but it moved to different locations around the world. So once it was um, in Mexico, in Vancouver, in Canada, in, um, in India, uh, it's Rome, um, and one more I, I can't remember. Boston, yes, thank you. Um, but it was a, a sometimes cost prohibitive for people to attend because it was uh, moving around all the time. But it was nice because people who were local um, who might not otherwise be able to attend a Joomla event were able to participate from those communities. But of course there are things that we still could be doing better, like different Joomla days might need different levels of support. If there's a Joomla day that has a huge community um, and they have a lot of sponsors and everything. They, they might not need as much funds as a smaller Joomla day um, where people are less likely to sponsor or uh, people can't put their own money in towards it. So right now we're doing across the board the same, the same level of uh, sponsorship, but it's not always the most fair thing to do. So that's something that possibly we could look at. And also we could do better at getting more participants for user research outside of our own bubble. And so we're looking at uh, different ways to do that because right now studies are shared on social media and so they're seen by basically the same people every time. Um, and so we're exploring some avenues to, uh, to break that bubble. Yes, and <laughs> instead of getting defensive, um, it's kind of ex accepting the, the impact of how things are. And as you said before, the first step of change is awareness. I think the second step is acceptance to, to, to see and then to from there to get things done, to get ideas. And, but you only can start if you know um, um, what's going on and to accept it and then you can, can go forward. So, yes. Yeah, it's easy to say when... when uh, when when you see some of these problems to say, oh, it's not, I, I haven't seen that. It's not part of our community. It's not, it's not something that actually affects people, but you might not know because it might not affect you as an individual, but chances are um, some of these barriers probably do affect some people in your, in your community on, on one level or another. So accepting that possibly that something could be improved is, is, is really important in order to be actually more inclusive and start actively reaching out and including your contributors uh, beyond just, well, if you'd like to get it done, just submit a PR. But there is no one right answer. Um, it really depends on the makeup of your community, on your organization, sometimes even down to um, 
individual teams what kind of barriers people are facing and what might work best. Small steps add, over, add up over time. So don't try and aim for perfection, um, aim for progress. You don't have to wait until you have the perfect solution in order to make these small changes to, to, to help your community. Um, sometimes those small steps take work, so be ready to put in that work, um, but, but don't look too far into, into the perfection. Yeah, so I think that's, that reaches uh, to the end. Oh. So do we have time for questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> are, there, are there any questions or any ideas? Yeah. So if you say the um, or one big uh, first step is being aware of it, um, do you have any methods to measure or to see, okay, we actually have for, let's say for this four different bubbles of problems, you sh you, the awareness in our group is at that level? Is that something you can measure or no methods how to measure it within your community? We don't have a, a set method currently. Um, there are possibly some methods that could be adapted to measure in that way if you wanted. But I would be cautious of some, sometimes trying to be uh, too focused on measurements and metrics because um, there's a certain point when, when you're measuring things uh, so much that you become focused on the metric and not necessarily on the human impact of it. It's like um, if, if you're uh, focused on having a low number of issues in GitHub, you'll be focused on closing the issues instead of focused on actually solving the problems that, that create the issues. So there are things that, uh, tools that you could look into if you want to get a better understanding of your team. Um, like uh, there are some surveys that you could do for team psychological safety. Um, that would be something that you could look into um, to just get a baseline on how people are feeling. Um, it's not really part of the talk, but, but there's, a, there's a research that shows that if a team feels psychologically safe and feels um, safe to take risks with what they're doing, that it's actually the top indicator of how performant and how effective a team will be. So it's also really good for the, the community to be able to do that. But it can also be a good indicator if someone is feeling included enough. Thank you uh, for the great talk. Um, you showed a wide variety of things that need to be uh, taken under advice. Many of them are, are very general, I think, to all communities and maybe even just products in general and, and, uh, and software. Uh, but uh, trying to tie it back to uh, how, where did you identify the, the significant pockets? I understand that metrics are maybe not hard metrics, but still, how do you weigh and understand, okay, this is where you put the effort? You will always find an individual that has a problem with something, but you need to address the critical masses that uh, created the churn in your community. How did you find these significant uh, critical masses and, and, uh, and uh, address them? Okay. It depends on the team. So, for example, we have um, the Joomla accessibility team, uh, and currently one of the team leaders is deaf. And so we know that in order for her team to be effective, we have to really focus on um, uh, making sure that the, she is supported and included um, in and not made to feel excluded because she uh, she's deaf. So we have done... It's, it's that team in which we're doing the, um, the uh, written meetings um, because it, it helps a lot in order to be able to actually see the, the messages. So it depends. It, it depends on the size of your organization, on the teams and everything. Um, and I think that it would be something that uh, team leaders would be best fit to, to evaluate um, in small pockets and, and then also collaborate between the team leaders, see where where the biggest problems are cropping up. Um, there's no one answer. Do you want to? No, no. Uh, that's what I just wanted to say. For us, it was more like um, trying from our personal experience. So we didn't have any, any system that we would lay over and, and, and have a look. So for us, it's more, uh, but that's why we are here, also to exchange with other communities, like how there's a good solution and how to find these points and how to solve them. So. How can we do better? Yes, how can we do better? So, if you have any ideas, just yeah. step up. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Secret and Crystal. And uh, yeah, we have uh, 
no minutes left for a break, but uh, <laughs> you could have one anyway. <laughs> but we'll continue.